also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Jesus teaches us that the last will be first, and the first will be last. Then Jesus went through towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you're going to stand outside, knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, well, We ate and drank with you, and, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know where you are. Where do you come from? And I don't know you. Away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord.
service of the basis for the sermon today comes to us from Luke chapter 13. In the name of Jesus, who is the way into heaven, the only way, and to him we claim, my dear Christian friends. Have you ever tried to lose weight? It can be hard. Especially as you get older, it gets even harder. Maybe you try to get a membership at a gym. Maybe you try a special diet like the keto diet to see if that works. Or perhaps you got to the point where you started to say, well, at least I'm not as big as other people are. At least I'm not as fat as that person. And we would do anything just to fit in that old pair of pants again. Well, that doesn't actually help us to think that way, to compare ourselves to other people. But still, this is the natural way in which we think. And something that I hear that, that helps with losing weight is to keep a food diary if, where you log all the different things you eat, and it tells you exactly, uh, with all honesty, what you're putting into your body. And so you say to yourself, you know, even though I'm exercising like crazy, I can't seem to be losing any weight. I'm only gaining weight. And then we read the food log and it says, oh, I've been eating 25 Twinkies a day at five breakfasts. Maybe that has something to do with it. And in the same way, when it comes to our spiritual well-being, we need someone to be honest with us about our spiritual health. We come to church for the sake of our spiritual well-being, and Jesus is here to tell us exactly what we need to hear even if sometimes it's hard for us to swallow. Because he tells us the door to heaven is actually narrow. So narrow that none of us can actually fit through it the way we are naturally. You can't take, you can't take anything with you. You can't tolerate the sins in your life and, and see that you can fit through the door at the same time. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Jesus himself, thankfully, makes us small enough so that we can fit through the narrow door. And he does this by giving us a special gift. When we look at Jesus in our reading, we see him traveling throughout the towns and the cities and the villages, teaching people about his salvation, how he is the way to heaven. And Jesus was always teaching. He was very serious about it. He was teaching all the time, constantly. And we see this tireless zeal as he would go proclaiming the gospel to all these different places, all the while he is headed to Jerusalem, which is where he's aiming, because that's where he is going to go to the cross. And what a beautiful picture of love this is for us, that that's where he was headed the whole time. And he was thinking about us the, the entire way, telling us the things that we need to hear. During this time, someone, we're not told who, asked Jesus a question, and he he said, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And it's a little bit of a strange question because it's more concerned about how many people are going to be saved rather than how anyone is saved in the first place. It wasn't bad to ask the question. It was a bit of a strange question. And it's good that he went to Jesus to ask it because it's better to ask than Jesus, right? But then you see how Jesus shifts the focus back on the more important question. How is anyone saved at all? Let's bring the question back to you, since you are some person. What road are you driving on? He said to him, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many of you will try to enter and will not be able to. Jesus is so serious for his love, about his love for this person and his love for us, that he answers with full sincerity. And as Jesus does many times, he answers the question the way it needs to be answered, rather than the way we expect him to answer it. And it causes us to ponder our own spiritual well-being. Are we taking our salvation for granted? He asked us. Jesus is wise to bring the question back, the focus back on us. Because after all, it would be too easy for us to assume based on 
things in our life, external things like our own good works, that, oh, we're shoo-ins for heaven. We say to ourselves, well, I go to church on uh, multi major holidays at least. Or we say, I have my name on the church roster and my family has gone to this church for three decades and we have our children baptized here. So we're probably good to go. Or, while we're listening intently to the sermon, we think to ourselves, man, this is a really good one. I really wish so-and-so were here to hear that bit of law. So that favor events, pointing the fingers outward. And we, and we tend to assume all oh, those poor people, those poor people who aren't good like me, those people who are much too big to fit through Jesus' narrow door, how can he possibly save them? Go up to them, I guess. We, we think. Which, which is when we think that way, when we think that way, Jesus needs to tell us, hey, Lots of those people that you're looking down on are entering heaven ahead of you because they aren't putting their trust in themselves. They're trusting only in me for salvation. And it's so easy for us because it comes naturally to us because of the sin that is in us to let these attitudes crop up in our hearts to say, well, I can, I, I'm pretty good. That's why I'm going to heaven. But Jesus wakes us up. Because he loves me. And he tells me the things that I'm not comfortable hearing. Even though I need to hear it, it's for my good. In this way, Jesus is exposing the possibility, the possibility that we're not actually on the right path. If you think you are standing in front of be careful that you don't fall away from faith. As believers, we want to be on the right path going through the narrow door. But like the person who's trying to, to exercise like crazy without changing his diet and his, and his bad eating habits, we realize that there are times when we're not doing as, as well spiritually as we think we are. There are times when we convince ourselves that our sinful habits, they're not so bad. And our good habits, we, we look to those and we say, well, because of that, that's a sign that I'm saved. Martin Luther provides a striking picture of what Jesus is saying here. He said, Jesus tells us, strive to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able to. Why not? Because they do not know what the narrow door is. The narrow door is faith, which makes a person small. Yes, even makes them into nothing at all. So that he must despair of all of his good works and all of his works at all and cling only to Christ. And let go of all things besides him. But there are the, the Cain-like saints, the saints like Cain, who thought that God approved because of the good things outwardly, despite the, the bad things going on in, in his heart. There, there are believers like that who think that the narrow door is good works. Therefore, they do not become small, and they do not despair of these works. Instead, they collect them into huge sacks and hang them on themselves and want to go through the narrow door like that, but they'll only go through as a camel with the huge humps on its back goes through the eye of a needle. When we get all puffed up by these external things, whether it's our church attendance or our good works or, or whatever it is, and then the pride of that, and then we start comparing ourselves and our faith to other people's faith, that's when we can't fit through the door. Any, any easier than a camel can fit through the eye of a needle. The time to repent is now, because that door is not always going to be open. It could close even today or tomorrow. Only Jesus is the one who makes us small enough fit through it. And keep in mind, don't forget, the door of salvation was small too. And Jesus was the only person who could fit through it. Jesus was the only person who could save us from our sins. Only he could go through that door of crucifixion for the sins of the whole world. And now the door he wants us to go through is so incredibly tiny that it's almost as if only one person 
person at a time you can manage to squeeze through. And that's really how we act in church. I'm sure it's a rare occasion and a wonderful occasion. And if there's some mass conversion, like on the day of Pentecost, but generally the Holy Spirit works one person at a time. He works in the heart of you one person at a time. And that's how you enter through the door and come to faith. One person at a time through baptism. But when you are born again, hearing the word of Christ, it's all about personal forgiveness. The picture is so small, but it's good small. Because Jesus cares for me and shapes me with his word, whittling me down, whittling all the way, whittling away all the extra baggage that we bring with us because Jesus cares for me and he shapes me with his word. And then we fit through the incredibly tiny door, making us the perfect size. And he tells me, this is just the only way. And I want to get you through this door. I'm going to do everything in my power to get you through so that you go to heaven. This is what Jesus' love for us looks like. And it boggles the mind. It defies human expectations. Because we expect the good people to go to heaven, or at least the outwardly good people, and the outwardly bad people to go to hell. But then you think of this situation, which, which is crazy to think about, but it really can happen. Imagine a mass murderer who is on death row and he's going to be executed, but then he hears about Jesus through a prison ministry representative, and he comes to believe, and when he's put to death, he ends up in heaven. Meanwhile, you look at a peaceful person like Gandhi who doesn't believe in Jesus and ends up in hell, and you think to yourself, that doesn't make any sense. That can't be right. You mean the skull of the earth? can come to faith? Yes. Faith is not a decision that a sinner makes. It's not something that we decide to choose. Rather, faith is a miracle gift in God, a miracle gift of God that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts when we hear his word, when we're baptized. That's the grace. Grace is a free gift. And that's for me, because I was the scum of the earth. I was like that mass murderer. I was the lowest of the low. But then Jesus put himself behind me, and he made himself last so that I could become first, so that I would become a holy child of God. That's how we all come to faith. We are children. Meanwhile, he took upon himself the cross of all of my guilt and all of my shame and my sins. So now, I'm first in him and in him alone. In God's kingdom, the things that we think about don't, all, don't, don't always go the way we expect them to. In fact, God often does things the opposite way we think that he should do them. But his love is undeniable, whether he's shown us tough love through the law or reminding us that our sins are forgiven through the gospel. So the first will be last, and the last will be first. That isn't to say the first aren't going to heaven. But we need to be careful. But we have nothing to fear either, because we know that Jesus is for us. Therefore, no one can stand against us. Here's the bottom line. Some believers grow careless and lose their gift of faith. On the other hand, God can work faith even in the hearts of the most unexpected people and bring them into his kingdom. But ultimately, God's gift of salvation is, in fact, for all people. His salvation is for you. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Know that when Jesus prepares that feast of salvation for you in heaven, he is preparing it for you. Look at what Jesus has done. Look at the people that he is bringing in from all over the world. This comes from Jesus who puts himself last in line so that we can come to faith. We can fit through that door, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of our good works or any other external signs. Jesus invites us to take, all of us, to take our places at the feast in his kingdom. And we will know the blessed peace of heaven, the joy of salvation and the true happiness that comes from being before the throne of God forever and ever. Amen. The peace of
God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Please stand as we join to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Almighty God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. All the stars, the sun and the moon, all energies and forces, the sea and clouds, are messengers of your wonder and might. For your creation we praise you, O Father. We pray for your church and your people. Grant us ministers and teachers who are led by your spirit and earnestly hold forth your word of life. Save us from all false prophets and deceitful guides, that we, being knit together in love, may with one mind strive for the truth of your word. Guard and defend our homes, that parents may be kept in the bonds of love and rule their children well, nourishing them in truth and righteousness. Bestow your favor on all useful labor in industry and agriculture, education and science, the professions and the arts, that in their advancement your people may prosper. 
We pray for all who may be ill in body, mind, or spirit, for all who may be in danger, and for all who may be in anxiety or in perplexity, for all who may be suffering disappointment or defeat. Be present with them in their afflictions. Show them the way out of their troubles, and save them for your mercy's sake. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy upon your servants, Ellen Hansen, the, si the, the, the sister of Jeff Hansen, who is diagnosed with breast cancer, with Jacob Walker's aunt Kim, who is undergoing chemotherapy, and for Mrs. Zahariades, Mrs. C, our preschool aide, who is suffering from health complications. If it is your will, spare their lives and restore their strength. You give your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servants and bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God. O oh God, giver of life, health, and safety and strength, we praise you for having granted your servant Ellen Gates recovery from her surgery, from her knee surgery. She's home and resting. May she daily remember your great goodness that she may serve you with a life that reflects genuine thankfulness for all of your blessings through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you have blessed our fellow believer, Curtis Garner, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ, our risen, and ever-living Lord. And hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Heavenly Father, you did not spare your own Son, but freely gave him up for us all. Mercifully grant these and all other acceptable petitions that you read in our hearts in the name of Jesus, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven,
of the service. We welcome those who are members of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, members of St. Peter, to join us for Holy Communion without judging any of any hearts. If you have any questions about Holy Communion, I am happy to meet with you and talk with you afterwards. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in the true Christian faith in this life and into life everlasting. You may go in peace because your sins are forgiven. Amen.
strengthen you and keep you in the true Christian faith in this life and into life everlasting. You may go in peace because your sins are forgiven. Amen. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in the true Christian faith in this life and into life everlasting. You may go in peace because your sins are forgiven. Amen.
have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
We're excited for you that you're going to be near your physical family, too, when you're up in Washington. They're moving there this Friday, and uh, they've, they've been wonderful help. Mackenzie has been a wonderful help uh, as the secretary in helping prepare the bulletins and, and everything. My work would be a lot harder without her. And thankfully, we do have uh, secretaries uh, who are taking the place, who have, who have been running up.